Hello, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Burn Your Draft, an exploration of the Reed College senior thesis process and experience. I'm your host, Frank Tangerlini, and this week we'll be talking with Libby O'Neill. Technology has reached new feats with voice service tools such as Alexa, but is this really a good thing? Libby O'Neill's Master of Arts in Liberal Studies thesis says otherwise. Welcome, Libby, to Burn Your Draft. If you want to start by giving us your name, where you're from, what department you thesis in, the name of your thesis, and why was this topic chosen? I don't know if you have a department per se, but... Yeah, my name is Libby O'Neill. I'm originally from Kansas City, and I'm currently living in New Haven now. Um, and in 2019, I graduated from Reed with a Master's of Art in Liberal Studies or MALS degree. Uh, I wrote my thesis about Amazon Alexa, and it was titled A Voice in Nothing More, Technological Embodiment in the Artificial Female Voice. So this uh, project focused on taking Amazon Alexa as sort of a primary source for thinking more broadly about gender, technology, embodiment, and what it means to have a conversation. Cool. So I don't know whether you want to start by talking about what the MALS thesis program is, or if you want to go into a little bit about what your thesis is. Either, I don't know if one... Yeah, I can talk a little bit about the MALS program first, if that helps. Yeah, so the MALS is a small master's program within Reed. It is a part-time master's program, and similar to the undergraduate program, you write a thesis. It's the culmination of all of your work. While the undergraduate thesis is spread out over two semesters, the MALS thesis is hypothetically done in one semester. I think for a lot of people, it tends to stretch out to take more than one semester. You know, I I did a lot of work in the semesters prior to my official thesis semester. Did you want me to talk about how I heard about the program? Yeah, no, that would be, yes. Uh, Yeah, so I heard about the MALS program through Google. I uh, came to read pretty haphazardly. (laughs) I got my undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering in 2014 from the University of Kansas. By the time I graduated there, I knew that I didn't want to be an engineer, but I had no idea what I did want to do. I knew I didn't want to live in Kansas anymore. Uh, So while I was working for a while as an engineer at Garmin, I was sort of looking around to see if I could find a master's program that wouldn't make me pick a major. And that's sort of how I found the Reed program. Kind of on a whim, I reached out to the program director at the time, Barbara Amon, and I emailed her and asked her if I could come see the campus. I went and visited, and I decided to quit my engineering job and move across the country and go to Reed and see what happened. (laughs) Um, So that's how I heard about it. It's maybe not the most recommendable way to find a master's program, but it's what I did. I don't know. I can't. I, it looks like it worked out. So we'll see. <laughs> what, what was the thesis? Yeah, so my, my thesis, uh, because the MALS program is interdisciplinary, you don't necessarily thesis within a specific discipline or a specific department. They encourage you to incorporate techniques from multiple disciplines in your thesis. So I found that approach to be very helpful for thinking about modern media and modern technology. So I focused on Amazon Alexa. In my first chapter of the thesis, I sort of read that as a primary text. I interviewed an Alexa a few times. I did some work thinking about the voice as a medium uh, in comparison with screens, which is how we spend a lot of our time interacting with technology. I thought it was phenomenologically significant to have this shift to having a voice-only conversation with this disembodied female voice. Then I turn to look at um, speculative fiction, looking at speculative fiction written about artificial female bodies and artificial female voices from the 1700s, 1800s. And then finally, I did some historical work looking at early computing, thinking about the Turing test and what that can tell us about the relevance of embodiment and gender when we talk about conversation. So that was my thesis. It kind of jumps around a lot, but. Nice. So what is the like symbol or idea of this disembodied female voice? Why is that something to study? Yeah, so I I conceptualized it as a disembodied female voice. And I think what's significant is that although A lot of these voices that we hear from personal assistants seem to be disembodied. They're not. They're very embodied. They're embodied in the speakers that allow us to 
hear their voices, they're embodied in code and chunks of data stored in, you know, data banks across the world. They're em enabled by satellites. They're enabled by low paid workers. They're enabled by all these different forces of capitalism and technology. And so it's actually this huge networked open form of embodiment that is sort of hidden from us beneath the disembodied female voice. I suggested to a certain extent that this open networked form of embodiment is formally similar to some fears around female promiscuity and that that maybe connects to the drive for this sort of pure disembodied female voice as a front for these dangerous feeling technological networks. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. What made you choose this topic? Like what, how did you come upon Alexa and interviewing Alexa? So I started working on this topic in Charlene Mackley's graduate seminar on anthropology and media studies. I started writing about it because I had a roommate in the house I was living in who had an Alexa and it just drove me crazy. He used it all the time. It was really annoying. I wanted him to stop using it. And I was annoyed enough about Alexa that I started kind of digging into the marketing materials, paying more attention to how people interacted with it. And I ended up writing uh, my final paper for that class on Alexa. And that final paper was sort of the seed that developed into my thesis. It lacked a lot of the components that my final thesis project had, but it had a lot of the same questions. And it was my first experience interviewing Alexa, looking at marketing materials, looking at uh, guides distributed to programmers who work on Alexa and that sort of thing. Do you have like, uh, I guess what was the outcome, but do you have like <laughs> recommendations for ways that Alexa should be changed? I guess I would shy away from suggesting like tweaks to commercial technology. I was more interested in trying to think explicitly about the types of technology that define our current living situation. I don't think changing, you know, they've changed Alexa, so if you use gendered slurs, she won't respond. I don't think that changes the social setup that she exists in. So my hope was to try and make explicit a lot of the contradictions or biases or capital arrangements that make Alexa possible. So I don't know if I would have recommendations to Amazon. I would not work for them. So how did you put all of those contradictions and findings together? Does the thesis outline and outcome look different for Amal's thesis? Like it, it feels like you're putting a lot more things together because of how many departments. I would say that it does feel scattered to me when I go back and read it. I'm very proud of the work I did, but it does attempt to think about a single object using a couple different disciplinary lenses. So I'm very grateful that I had the freedom to do that in a project. I think it's easy to sort of get tunnel vision and use just the tools of one discipline. And I think when we're talking about things like commercial technology, there's so many different factors that you, it helps to look at it through a couple different lenses. However, I'm now currently studying history more specifically. So I'm hoping to be able to sharpen my abilities in that area. Nice. Did you have like a fine, like a conclusive argument or anything? Something that stuck with me when I'm thinking about technology is Hannah Arendt's invitation for us to think what we are doing. I think it's very easy to take technology at face value. It's very easy not to think about what networks we're participating in, like what networks we're participating in when we're using Zoom or when we're using Google or when we're using Amazon. So my hope would be to ask people through that thesis to think about what they're doing, whether or not that means you change what you're doing or you change how you talk about what you're doing, but to at least think about what it is we're doing with technology. Yeah, I like that. Um, did you have any unexpected challenges when you were writing the thesis and doing this process? I spent a lot of time preparing for the thesis process. So my recommendation would be to 
take a lot of time to take notes, to outline, to work with your advisor, and to have a plan so that when it comes to writing, it goes smoothly. I think when I actually started my thesis semester, everything went very smoothly. Honestly, I, I didn't have a lot of unexpected problems, but I also had, you know, I'd done all the reading already. I had outlined, I had, you know, an index card system that looked very scary. So when I sat down to do the writing, it's always hard to write, but I didn't have any unexpected challenges. I think navigating read as a master's student when it's a school designed for undergraduates is a challenge in its own way. You know, the library doesn't always know what you're talking about. <laughs> Teachers don't know what you're talking about. But. Are there any other challenges that that presented? I fully really didn't know that Reed had any kind of postgraduates. Most people don't. It's a weird program. <laughs> it's a lot of fun though. I really, I really loved it. You know, I came into it not knowing at all what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to do something different from what I had been doing. And because it's so interdisciplinary, you basically, you can take classes in any discipline you want to. You get to talk to amazing professors and amazing students who've done so many things in life. It gave me a lot of opportunity to think more broadly and to figure out what it was I really wanted to talk about. So I think it's a great program. I think more people should do it. It sounds like a great program. Yeah. I was just sitting here thinking, wow, maybe I should do this. <laughs> you can get, I, uh, one of my closest friends in the malls program did her undergrad and her master's at Reed. So she got to wear two sets of laurels when she graduated. Um, so I guess it's maybe not a challenge, but how, how did you interview Alexa? How did that happen? <laughs> yeah, I had some close friends from work who did have an Alexa in their house. You know, they used it, you know, for its timer function to play music, that sort of thing. And I talked to them about the project I was working on and they were, it was a couple and they were, they were both interested in hearing me talk to their Alexa and ask her questions about her gender identity and uh, ask Alexa about the Turing test and weird things like that. So I went over to their house a few times and interviewed their Alexa. Did she have good responses? Like I feel like she would just say I don't have an answer for that, but am I wrong? Often she would not have a good response. There were a few gems that came out. I think when you ask her about if she's a woman, she says she thinks of herself as female with a jolt of girl power, <laughs> which I haven't really gotten over. So, wow. Yeah, yeah. It was actually Somebody during the time. Diana. Yeah, during the time I worked on Alexa. So starting in Charlene Mackley's class to when I finished my thesis, Amazon changed from referring to Alexa with it to referring to it as a she in their marketing materials, which was an interesting transition. I don't have any access into why they did that, but. Did you bring up, like along with Alexa, did you talk about Siri at all? And how... Yeah, she says she likes to hang out with all her friends in the cloud. <laughs> I guess I mean like in general. Yeah, Siri oh, in my thesis? The... Yeah, I, in my introduction, I briefly mentioned that Alexa is not the only female voice assistant on the market right now, that there's sort of been this fad of having female voice assistants. You have Cortana, Siri, Alexa, Google Home. I decided to focus on Alexa specifically, first of all, because it was what I'd been around. Second of all, I think Amazon has put more effort into personifying Alexa relative to some of the other female voice assistants. And thirdly, because Amazon, the company, is also so deeply enmeshed in these very material networks of distribu distribution that I was interested how um, this disembodied voice was related to those very material networks. So I, I mentioned Siri and some of the other voice assistants, but I thought it would be more helpful to really dig into one. Yeah, no, I think Alexa definitely is more of this home source that you can like buy things and play music off of. 
my roommate with the Alexa, he, I would like ask him to buy toilet paper because it was his turn. And he would tell Alexa to buy toilet paper. And we lived half a mile from the store. <laughs> I'm like, just go buy toilet paper. Freshman year, the person who lived above me had an Alexa and he would use it as an alarm clock. But he would leave the room sometimes before the alarm would go off. So I would go into the hallway and scream, Alexa, stop. <laughs> but I was always angry at him. I was never, it's not Alexa's fault. <laughs> no, it's not her fault. But yeah, it's very easy for people to project their emotions into it. Um, I think it's interesting to think what we project and reflect onto our technologies in conversation. <laughs> Yeah, I think if any other person just didn't hear what I said, I wouldn't get as upset as I do. <laughs> uh, so what skills did you acquire or strengthen during this experience? By far, this was the longest thing I'd ever written. I think it is for most people who are doing the undergrad program as well. Uh, my, my undergrad experience was in engineering where I took one English class. So... <laughs> So relative to that, this was definitely the longest cohesive thing I'd ever tried to write. So I think the skills involved in preparing for that, in managing notes, in outlining, in managing citations. I, for some reason, did it all in LaTeX just to make it harder for myself. Uh, so I think all of those skills for managing and preparing a long form piece of writing are going to be very helpful as I move forward. Since I'm currently in a PhD program, I will apparently have to write a dissertation someday. So I think that that thesis process will be a good building block for building up to something like that. Yeah, I, I think you've hit all of the same bases that other theses people have respond to that question with. Um, time management, product, project management. Um, but how, uh, I guess, how do you think your thesis experience will inform your life after read? You said that you're studying history right now. Was that at all a product of this thesis? Yeah, I'm specifically um, at Yale's program for the history of science and medicine. So it's not a general history program. It's specifically focused in thinking about questions of science, technology, and medicine. And I'll more generally be focusing on science and technology. So the projects that I'm interested in investigating are very deeply connected to the basic questions I was asking during my master's thesis. I don't know if I will do further research on voice assistance specifically, but I think the general questions around what the stakes are in the human-machine interaction will be important in my further research. What, um, what further research do you think, like, what will it look like, or if you can talk about it? <laughs> I don't know. I have a lot of ideas. I think when you're writing a thesis, you get really laser focused on that one idea. So I've been sort of trying to open back up a little bit, read a lot of things, let my perspectives widen. Um, my focus in the program has been on, I'd say, physical sciences, theories of mind, and computing history. And then I've also been taking a class in the English department on media studies. So I think those general themes and ideas will be the building blocks for some great and incisive project that I'll come up with in the future. That's cool. So you've returned back to your sciences too. I have come full circle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm aware of the irony. <laughs> Nice. Well, I, I don't have any more questions, but do you have anything else that you'd like to add about your thesis and about this process? If I have anything specifically, I sort of feel like I got kind of lucky with my project. I ended up working with an advisor who was a great fit. I prepared for it in an orderly fashion and I finished it on time and then I burned my drafts. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Sorry. How do you choose an advisor if it's multidiscipline? Is there advisors that are like more cut out for Mall's thesis?
I would say that finding an advisor when you're in the MALS program is the hardest part of the thesis process. And I think the experience of my peers would support that because the projects tend to be interdisciplinary and also because we don't take as many classes overall. We're not in a specific department that's our home department. So we're just, we don't spend as much time around individual professors as maybe some undergraduates do. We're not assigned a professor as our thesis advisor. So I actually never took a class from my advisor. I met him outside of class and we started talking about my thesis idea and it evolved into an advisor relationship. My, my advisor was Jake Fraser in the German studies department. And I'd actually never taken a class in German studies. Um, however, his interests were also very interdisciplinary. He's teaching some media studies courses at Reed, and he ended up being a good fit for the type of project I was putting together. Yeah, we now have a film and media studies minor for undergrad. Good, so, and I assume he's involved with that? Yeah. <laughs> Is the media studies aspect, I think. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. No, we were emailing a little bit about one of the courses he's teaching this semester that looked really interesting Whoa. about <laughs> androids in science fiction. Must have missed that one. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad that uh, you were able to find such a good fit for a thesis advisor, and that that wasn't that too bad of a challenge. Yeah, I, but I, yeah, that's what I would say is, was the biggest challenge in my process was finding someone who was a good fit, both interpersonally and in terms of the material that they had, a, that they were familiar with. It's, yeah. Maybe not downside, but uniqueness of the MALS program is that to a certain extent, what classes you can take is up to the whims of what teachers are teaching master's courses that semester. Essentially, they offer three master's courses every semester. Um, professors will sort of apply to teach a master's course and propose a master's course. So you sort of pick from the ones that are available. Um, I supplemented it with taking some undergrad courses as independent study so I could be a little more specific. But. What makes a class a master class? meets less frequently and you get less credit. <laughs> Got you. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I took undergrad and graduate classes and they're the same amount of work, but you get half a credit for the graduate ones and a full credit for the undergrad ones. So. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you for telling me about your thesis and for telling me. Yeah, thank you for having me on. It's been great to talk about it with a little bit of distance from the thesis. You know, I think you spend a lot of time talking about it when you're writing it and when you're finishing it. And it's nice to like, think about it again. Yeah, I, I've yet to have somebody who was angry about talking about their thesis, so. <laughs> Thank you, Libby, for your time and for telling us about your thesis. Thank you for listening, and I hope you join us again to talk to more seniors about their thesis and better understand why you'd want to burn your draft. Burn Your Draft is a production of Reed College and the Center for Life Beyond Reed, created jointly by students, alumni, and staff. This episode was produced and engineered by me, Reed College student Frank Tangerlini. Our executive producer is Seth Paskin, class in 1990, with technical advising from staff member Joe Janiga. Nate Martin, staff member in class of 2016, is our project manager. Music by Jack Salvucci, class of 2020, and podcast art by alumni Henry Gotchlik and Lillianne Pham, class of 2020. This podcast was made possible by a gift from Seth Paskin. Another shout out to Jack Salvucci. You can find them as Boy Talks on Spotify, Bandcamp, and more.